25 years of my life is still trying to get up that great big hill of hope for a destination. I realized quickly when I knew I should that the world is made of this brotherhood of man for whatever that means. And so I cry sometimes when I'm lying in bed just to get it all out what's in my head and I'm, I'm feeling a little peculiar. And so I wake in the morning and I step outside I take a deep breath and I get real high and I scream the top of my lungs what's going on and I say hey yeah yeah hey yeah yeah I say hey what's going on and I try oh my god do I try I try And I pray, oh my God, do I pray, I pray for a single day, for a revolution, and I cry sometimes when I'm lying in bed, just to get it all out, what's in my head, cause I'm, I'm feeling a little peculiar. Outside and I take a deep breath and I get real high and I scream at top of my lungs, what's going on? Hello, welcome to the salon today. Uh, instead of a drink, I've, <laughs> I've got uh, my small spaniel with me, so you might hear him masticating over a chew that we've given him to keep quiet, <laughs> rather than me slobbering over uh, a drink uh, this time. Um, I just totally forgot because it's I'm filming it in this first, what feels like, glorious day of uh, spring, which is quite exciting. Um, and it's a salon all about, so just put me out of the headspace of, uh, of boozing, but I hope you're boozing. Um, but this salon that we're hoping to catch some of bit of the sea behind me to share with you um, from our lockdown library um, is all about Tova, Jan Tova Jansen. So that's partly why we're trying to honour the sea in the background. Um, I think she was a big vodka drinker, so if you can get yourself some vodka, that'd be awesome. I will watch this uh, with you on the message board uh, and um, this is quite meta because I'll be doing this as we're doing this now, so I'll be messaging the messaging and so on. Uh, and I'll have vodka with me then. Um, so yeah, Tova Jansen. Uh, basically, I have loved her since my childhood with uh, these books, uh, which um, were given to me by an old family friend um, who uh, had brought her children up on them. Um, she was the most remarkable friend, which befits this remarkable author. Um, <clears throat> they were the Partridge family, might they were part of the peace movement that my mum was also in. Uh, that's how I knew them. And she used to babysit me. Uh, she let me keep a fish eye, that she because we were vegetarian and she was preparing a fish. And she let me keep the eye and I kept it in a little jar until it just dis disappeared. It just gets smaller and smaller and disappeared. So that was cool. Um, and uh, she also was absolutely positive I was going to be famous. More for her. And, uh, and so she let me sign a piece of her. She said, what can I, what can I sign for you to be for your famous one? Do I, you sign something in my house and I'll sell it. So I got under her. I, so I, could, I, I thought, she's such a cool person. Maybe I could sign under her table. And she let me write my own name, Rebecca, as it was then, Noel's all the way across under her table. Um, and then every time she babysat me, I'd go around and check that it was still there. Uh, and it would be all the way under her table uh, of her kitchen, Rebecca and her wells. So this is the kind of interesting person that gives you Moomin books, is basically what I'm saying to you here. Um, and uh, and obviously, at first, Tova is, we, I, I, so I, did, I only knew her as this, this huge children's artist and, and, and uh, writer. But of course, she's way more than that, as we as we all now know and appreciate. Um, she starts on the Moomins start off as satirical cartoons, and she's so brave. She takes a pop at everyone in these cartoons. She's taking a pop at Hitler. She's taking a pop at Stalin. She's taking a pop at Mussolini. Um, uh, she's a really, really brave 
Um, and, uh, and then she feels uh, very, these are hugely popular, these cartoons, and she feels very constricted by them. So then her brother takes over and, uh, and he starts to write the cartoons and she gets to go off and do all the things she wants to do because she's a fine artist. She loves the theater. She makes sets for the theater. Um, she's, a, she's a craftswoman and she wants to go off and live uh, on her island on the sea with her lovely life partner as well. Um, so she has all these different outlets. She's writing books into her 70s. Um, and yet, as she put it, she's best known for creating this, she puts it, ugly little creature, which I find heartbreaking. I mean, look at these creatures. These are not ugly. They're so cute. But that's what she said. She said she was best known for making these, these ugly little creatures. Um, now, I'm talking as if I am this great expert on her. Actually, I'm just a massive fan. The reason that I sound like I know what I'm talking about is because this was all told to me by my very good friend, uh, Gabriella Bjork Gabatas, uh, who I'm going to share an interview with you now. She's properly uh, a real expert on Tove. She even says uh, her name right because she's Swedish, so you'll hear how to actually say it, which I'm not doing. Um, and uh, we had very f a couple of very minor technical, like basically it was a Zoom call, so a couple of signal issues. So don't worry, don't second guess yourself. The little tiny glitches are in the Zoom recording. They're not on your. They're not at your end. Don't adjust your sets. Um, but uh, it's a. This is a little taste of how much um, uh, uh, Bella knows about about Tova and has personal experience of her as well, which is quite exciting. The full interview. I couldn't bear to to lose all the extra stuff she told me. It's so fascinating. Um, I'm putting that up on our YouTube channel after this salon, so you can have a, a longer listen of a sort of podcasty type interview between the two, as if you'd like to. Um, and uh, after the interview, she's going to read a little section of the summer book, one of uh, Tova's amazing uh, adult stories. Um, and then I'll see you again after that. Yeah, so when, when Sweden was a superpower, uh, we ruled Finland, among other things, and um, there was a cluster of Swedish people left in Sweden when we did, when in Finland, when the countries divided, or when we left Finland. So there is a minority group, which is the Finland Swedes, and they speak Swedish with a very lovely sing-song accent. And there's part of this m minority in Finland that Tove Jansson came from where she was born in. And she had lots of family in Stockholm. Her mother came from Stockholm in Sweden. Yes, so still, there is still Swedish speaking theater in Finland. And that's where my father went as a young actor, fresh out of drama school in Stockholm. He was offered a very good position at the Swedish speaking theater of Vasa in Finland. Um, it was, in those days they came, the big theatre directors came to the, to the drama schools, especially the ones in Stockholm, which was very, very fine. And they went shopping, basically, for, uh, for actors. And um, there was a few, there was a few theatres in Sweden who was offering their places, but the, the, the Finnish speaking theatre of Arsa, the, the director, said, well, what do I have to give you? For, to come to, to, to Varta. And uh, that went, well, I, I don't know. I said, because uh, everything, they were, all, they were always offered, you know, sort of small parts because they were young and new. Mm. And he said, how about Peer Git? Will you come? And he went, yeah, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> so he ended up in Finland, my dad. Amazing. And how did that link you, him to Tove Jansson and then to your memories of her? How did they, because Peer Gint seems one world, and to Tove and Moomin seems another. What happened? Yes. So, um, well, Tove, um, after she wrote Moomin, she um, met her, the director. So that was the first uh, female love of Tove's, I believe. And she was the theatre director, and they decided that they were going to do Moomin on stage. And it came up in, uh, they played, obviously, because Tove was uh, Swedish speaking. But I, as I understand, her finish was not very good. So they, it, this went up on the Swedish speaking theatre um, and they must have met there, my dad and Tova. The thing is, my dad, I lost my dad in 2000 and my mother in 2004. I've tried to Google it, but I mean, it's not, I, I, there's no, there's no, there's nothing, no written evidence. But I do remember as a child going to see Moomin 
on stage. And it might have been um, TV, because they direct film TV in, in those days. We're talking 70s now, maybe late 60s. And um, so, yeah, so then, sorry, the, 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 um, the initial Moomin play in Finland was a flop. So they decided to take it to Stockholm. They were, well, forget about Finland, let's take it on tour. And they went to Stockholm and it was a huge success, huge. And, and it became sort of the, the, this provincial uh, accent that they, that they spoke, the sort of Swedish Finnish, became the cultural accent. So if you, if you came from Finland and you had this accent, I mean, everybody stopped and listened. It, it became sort of the, the bohemian, the theatre, the, the accent for the theatre. This provincial little dialect. So they, this, this obviously movement popped up in all the theatres in Sweden. I mean, every, every, there's municipal theatres and there's provincial theatres and everywhere they played movement. And then obviously it was the televised. And I remember, I must have been very young, and it's a sketchy sort of childhood memory, but um, these huge trolls. I mean, I, I'd read Boom and tiny little cute trolls <laughs> and suddenly these giants. And then, um, and suddenly one of these giants unscrewed the head with this enormous nose to and inside was my dad. <laughs> Did you ever yeah. meet Tova herself when you were visiting your dad in these situations? Yes, I have a memory of this tiny little woman. <laughs> and I remember the, um, and I remember she being really, really small and I mean, she, I, I believe she was quite small. She was about 160 centimeters or something. But with these enormous trolls, she seemed <laughs> almost like little Mai. I mean, she seemed like a little midget. And I think she'll take me to my grave, to be honest, on, because she, I, so I grew up in movement. And then, of course, in my, I don't know, 20s, I discovered the summer book and 30s. And then, I mean, it just develops. I mean, she grows up, she, her writing grows up. Mm. Even the Moomins grow up. So she, and she's, she wrote well into her 70s. And I've just recently read her, her a book called Letters from Clara, which she wrote in her 70s. Mm. I'm thinking, you know, wherever stage in my life, it's always gonna slit, you know, slip in somewhere with, with some work or other. I think she get in the 30s, she was first she went to art school in Stockholm. I think she was only a teenager when she left and went to live in Sweden. And then um, in her 20s, she traveled extensively in Germany, Italy, and then she ended up at, um, at the art school in Paris, which her parents had met at. Oh, really? Yes. So she was in pre-war Europe. She was traveling ex extensively. And because she was wild, she did really adventurous stuff about it, I mean, proper out there, you know, climbed mountains and swam rivers and just, just crazy stuff. So she was always, she has this sort of strange, there's this juxtaposition between being completely wild and extremely brave and very, very quiet and shy and soft-spoken. Oh, wow. Yes, very quiet, very she had a very small voice. Oh, like yeah. a moomin. <laughs> yes, like a moomin. <laughs> yes. Little sniff voice. Little sniff voice. <laughs> yes, yes. And I oh. think, you know, that's a I think little Mai would be her altruity. She wouldn't behave like little Mai, but I think little Mai might have been an output for her when she felt really angry. So she sketched little Mai who could say and shout things out, you know, because he wouldn't nice I found online a personality test that linked you to your moomin. You answered a load of questions and then it would tell you what moomin you were. And very like Tova, it didn't always hold back. Like a, a friend of mine did it and came out as the groke and things like that. So it can be really cruel. Um, but mine uh, was little my, and I was like, I have nothing left to achieve. Yes. I'm done. I'm that's, done. That's a very good one. <laughs> I don't think it's true because I'm far too keen on having people's approval to be little Mai, really. But obviously she's in there somewhere, which I'm very pleased about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you it so you can find out who you are. <laughs> oh, good, yeah, I, I'd like to know. 
I like to think that I that I develop. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. we can go through the myriad of all the movements, non the non-binary yeah. spectrum of movements. A very good friend, <laughs> friend of mine has always called me Moomin Mama. Oh, that's yeah. nice. But again, she's a bit well behaved, isn't she? I feel like there's yeah. a lot more mimble in you than um than that. Yeah, yeah, well, that was nice. thank you. <laughs> so and have you heard her songs? No, no what are her songs? She wrote, she didn't write the music, she wrote the text. And one of them called Hestris, which means autumn song, is oh. one of it's one of the go-to for for, for singing together in Sweden and Finland. It is one of the most beautiful songs. And again, that I've grown up with, I'm gonna sing a little bit of it to you. Yes, please. Just because, because you haven't heard it. And I know you need to Google it and find it. And then learn it on your, on your... Um... On my uke, <laughs> on my ukulele. I was gonna call you balalaika, but it's not. <laughs> I'm not clever enough to play a balalaika. <laughs> That's way beyond my pain. Yeah, and the two's father played in Panamaica, apparently. Oh, nice. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's very difficult. <laughs> so again, it's like this. I, I'll only sing the first verse. I'll see if I can. Vägen hem var mycket lång Och ingen har jag mött Nu blir kvällarna kyliga Och sena Kom trösta med en smula För nu är jag ganska trött Och med en så förfärligt alena. Jag märkte aldrig förut att mörkret är så stort. Går och tänker på allt det där man borde. Det finns så många saker jag skulle sagt och gjort. Och det är så väldigt lite jag gjorde. Skynda dig älskade, skynda att älska Dagarna mörkna minut för minut Tänd våra ljus, det är nära till natten Snart är den korta sommaren slut That's the first it's really, it's really, and what she says is that the road home is very, very long and I've not met anyone. Oh. And now the evenings are getting cold and late. Come comfort me a little bit because I'm very tired and suddenly so very alone. I never noticed before that the darkness is so big. I go around thinking of all that one should have done. There are so many things I should have said and done and so very little I accomplished. And then the refrain is, hurry, beloved, hurry to love. The days, they go darker minute by minute. Light our candles, it's close to the night. Soon the flowering summer is over. It was an early, very warm morning in July, and it had rained during the night. The moss and crevices were drenched with moisture and all the colours everywhere had deepened. The vegetation in the morning shade was like a rainforest of lush, evil leaves and flowers, which she had to be careful not to break as she searched. She held one hand in front of her mouth and was constantly afraid of losing her balance. What are you doing? asked little Sophia. Nothing, her grandmother answered. That is to say, she added angrily, I'm looking for my false teeth. The child came down from the veranda. Where did you lose them? she asked. Here, her grandmother said. I was standing right here and they fell out somewhere in the peonies. They looked together. Let me, Sophia said. You can hardly walk. Move over. She dived beneath the flowering roof of the garden and crept among the stalks and stems. It was rather pretty and mysterious on the soft black earth. 
and there were the teeth, white and pink, a whole mouthful of old teeth. I've got them, the child cried and stood up. Put them in. But you can't watch, Grandmother said. That's private. Sophia held the teeth behind her back. I want to watch, she said. So Grandmother put the teeth in with a smacking noise. They went in very easily. It had really hardly been worth mentioning. When are you going to die? The child asked. And Grandmother answered, Soon. But that is not the least concern of yours. Why? Her grandchild asked. She didn't answer. She walked out into the rock and towards the ravine. We're not allowed out there, Sophia screamed. I know, the old woman answered disdainfully. Your father won't let either one of us go out to the ravine. But we're going anyway. Because your father is asleep and he won't know. They walked out across the granite. The moss was slippery. The sun had come up a good way now and everything was steaming. The whole island was covered with a bright haze. It was very pretty. Will they dig a hole? asked the child amiably. Yes, she said, a big hole. And she added insidiously, big enough for all of us. How come? the child asked. They walked on towards the point. I've never been this far before, Sophia said. Have you? No, her grandmother said. They walked all the way out onto the little promontory, where the rock descended into the water in terraces and became fainter and fainter until there was total darkness. Each step down was edged with a light green seaweed fringe that swayed back and forth with the movement of the sea. I want to go swimming, the child said. She waited for opposition, but none came. So she took off her clothes, slowly, nervously. She glanced back at her grandmother. You can't depend on people who just let things happen. She put her legs in the water. <gasps> it's cold, she said. Of course it's cold, the old woman said. A thought somewhere else. What did you expect? The child slid in up to her waist and waited anxiously. Swim, her grandmother said. You can swim. It's deep, Sophia thought. She forgets I've never swum in deep water unless someone was with me. And she climbed out again and sat on the rock. It's going to be a nice day today, she declared. The sun had climbed higher. The whole island and the sea were glistening. The air seemed very light. I can dive, Sophia said. Do you know what it feels like when you dive? Of course I do, her grandmother said. You let go of everything and get ready and just dive. You can feel the seaweed against your legs. It's brown. 
and the waters clear, lighter towards the top, with lots of bubbles. And you glide. You hold your breath and glide and turn and come up. Let yourself rise and breathe out. And then you float, just float. And all the time with your eyes open, Sophia said. Well, naturally, people don't dive with their eyes shut. Do you believe I can dive without me showing you? The child asked. Yes, of course, Grandmother said. Now get dressed. We can get back before he wakes up. The first weariness came closer. When we get home, she thought. When we get back, I think I'll take a little nap. And I must remember to tell him this child is still afraid of deep water. It's pretty lovely, wasn't it? Thank you, Bella. That's uh, such a great book. Um, I'm Bella, such a great person. Uh, I'm going to try and do a little reading now uh, from from Moomin's book to embrace the the all all of her classics. Um, as you can see, it's going to be a bit of a challenge because I've read this book so much as a child that it's literally coming apart. Um, but uh, I feel like you have to have, have well loved a book for it to it has its own character then, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, bear with me if things start floating out of this. Um, but the bit I've chosen is um, is from. Moomin, uh, Moomin Land Midwinter. So, uh, and the reason I've chosen it, so what's happened in this is that usually Moomin's hibernate and uh, Moomin Troll for some reason has woken up and all of his family and all his friends' families are also asleep and they're trying to keep them warm and things. But he, only he and little Mai from the usual kind of clan are awake. <clears throat> so he enters a winter world that he's not, he's never been in before. And he meets a character and the reason that I've chosen this is really because of this character uh, called Two Tiki. And Two Tiki is based on uh, Tova's real life partner. Um, and always in, in every adaptation that I've seen so far, they, uh, Two Tiki is changed into being uh, a boy. But in the books, uh, Two Tiki is a girl uh, and she's wise and practical and a bit tough lovey. Uh, and a reflection of Tove's lesbian relationship and it really frustrates me when people erase that out of uh, the stories. So I wanted to read a bit to show you what a lovely piece of writing I think Tutiki is um, uh, and, uh, and honour honor the, the relationship Tove had with the real Tutiki in real life. Um, and uh, I also love uh, the complexity in the, of the way in which um, uh, Tove wrote, uh, wrote for children because you're so powerless as a child and you, you don't have, things just happen to you. You don't have necessarily the vocabulary or the opportunity to voice complex emotions and situations you find yourself in. Um, and I think amazing children's literature like this is such a gift because it gives you that ability. And I'm so grateful that for the people like the Partridges uh, and my mum who brought this sort of book into my life. So. The same afternoon, Too Ticky felt in her nose that the great cold was on its way. She poured river water over the horse and carried armfuls of wood to the bathing house. Keep inside today because she'll be coming, Too Tiki said. <clears throat> the invisible shrews nodded and an agreeing rustle was heard from the cupboard. Too Tiki went out to warn the others. Take it easy, said little Mai. I'll be coming in all right when I feel the pinch in my toes. And I can always throw some straw over the mimble. She steered her silver tray out onto the ice. Too Tiki continued her way through the valley. On the path, she met the squirrel with the marvellous tail. Keep at home tonight, because the great cold is coming, said Too Tiki. Yeah, yes, yes, said the squirrel. You haven't seen a spruce cone I left somewhere? I haven't, said Too Tiki, but promise you won't forget what I told you. Stay at home after twilight. It's important. The squirrel nodded absentmindedly. Tutiki went on to the Moomin house and climbed the rope ladder that Moomin Troll had hung out. She opened the hatch and called to him. Moomin Troll was darning the family's bathing trunks with red cotton yarn. I wanted to tell you that the great cold is on her way, Tutiki said. 
A still greater one, said Moomin Troll. How big do they grow? This is the most dangerous of them all, said Tutiki, and she'll come in the afternoon when the sky changes to green straight in from the sea. Is she a she then? asked Moomin Troll. Yes, and very beautiful, said Tutiki, but if you look her in the face, you'll be frozen to ice. You'll be hard like a biscuit and not even crumble. That's why you better keep it home tonight. Tutiki crawled back out onto the roof. Women Troll went down to the cellar and filled more peat into the central heating stove. He spread some carpets over the sleeping family. Then he wound the clocks and went out. He felt like having some company when the Lady of the Cold would make her visit. As Women Troll reached the bathing house, the sky was growing paler and was greener than before. The wind had gone to sleep and the dead reeds sprouted stiff and immobile from the ice by the shore. He listened and he thought he could hear a very low, deep, softly humming tone in the silence itself. Perhaps it came from the ice that was freezing itself deeper and deeper down into the sea. The bathing house was well warmed and on the table stood Mummy Mama's blue teapot. He sat down in the garden chair and asked, when is she coming? Quite soon now, said Tutiki, but don't worry. Well, the Lady of the Cold doesn't worry me any, said Moomin Troll. I'm worried by the others, those that I don't know anything about, like the dweller under the sink, and the one in the cupboard, or the Groak, who only looks at you and never says a word. Tutiki rubbed her nose and thought. Well, it's like this, she said. There are a lot of things that have no place in summer and autumn and spring. Everything that's a little shy and a little rum. Some kinds of night animals and people that don't fit in with others and that nobody really believes in. They keep out of the way all the year and then when everything's quiet and white and the nights are long and most people are asleep, then they appear. Do you know them? asked Moomin Troll. Some of them. Uh, the dweller under the sink, for instance, quite well, but I believe he wants to lead a secret life so I can't introduce you to each other. Moomin Troll kicked at the table leg and sighed. I see, I see. But I don't want to lead a secret life. Here one comes stumbling into something altogether new and strange, and not a soul even asking one in what kind of world one's lived before. Not even little Mai wants to talk about the real world. Well, how does one tell which one is the real one? said Tutiki, with her nose pressed against a pane. Here she is. The door pushed open, and little Mai sent the silver tray clattering in along the floor. The sail's not bad, she said, but what I really need now is a muff. Your mother's egg warmer will never do, no matter where I cut the holes. Already it looks like someone wouldn't give it, wouldn't have the cheek to give it away to a displaced hedgehog. Uh, author's note. A displaced hedgehog is a hedgehog that's been removed from its home against its will and not even had time to pack its toothbrush. Hmm, I can see that, replied Mintrol with a bleak look at the egg warmer. Little Mai threw it on the floor and it was immediately tidied off into the stove by an invisible shroom. Well, is she coming? said Little Mai. I think so, said Tutiki. Let's take a look outside. They went out on the landing stage and sniffed towards the sea. The, the evening sky was green all over and all the world seemed to be made of thin glass. All was silent, nothing stirred, and the slender stars were shining everywhere and twinkling in the ice. It was terribly cold. Yes, she's on her way. We'd better go inside. The shrew stopped playing under the table. Far out on the ice came the Lady of the Cold. She was pure white, like candles. But if one looked through her, the right pane, she became red, and through the left one, she became pale green. Suddenly, Mumintrol felt the pain become so cold that it hurt, and he drew back his snout in rather a fright. They sat down by the stove and waited. Don't look, said Tutiki. Hello, someone's crawling into my lap, said little Mai surprisedly and looked down at her empty skirt. It's my shrews, said Tutiki. They're scared. Sit still and they'll go away soon. Now the Lady of the Cold was walking past the bathing house. Perhaps she cast an eye through the window because an icy draught swept through the room and darkened the red-hot stove for a moment. Then it was over. Feeling a little embarrassed, the invisible shrews jumped down from little Mai's lap and everybody rushed to the window and looked out. The Lady of the Cold was standing by the reeds. Her back was turned and she was bending down over the snow. It's the squirrel, said Tutiki. He has forgotten to keep at home. The Lady of the Cold turned her beautiful face towards the squirrel 
and distractedly scritched him behind one ear. Bewitched, he stared back at her, straight into her cold blue eyes. The Lady of the Cold smiled and continued on her way. But she left that foolish little squirrel lying stiff and numb with all his paws in the air. Too bad, said Tutiki grimly and pulled her, pulled her cap over her ears. She opened the door and a cloud of white snowfall came whirling in. She darted out and in a moment she slipped back in again and laid the squirrel out on the table. The invisible shrews kept running with hot water and rolled the squirrel in a warmed towel. But his little legs sprouted just as sadly and stiffly in the air and he did not move a whisker. He's quite dead, Miss Mai said matter-of-factly. At least he saw something beautiful before he died, said Moomin Troll in a trembling voice. Oh well, said Little Mai, in any case he's forgotten about it now. I'm going to make myself a sweet little muff out of his tail. But you can't, Moomin Troll cried, very upset. He must have his tail with him in the grave, because he's going to be buried, isn't he, Tutiki? Mm, replied Tutiki, but it's very hard to tell if people take any pleasure in their tails when they're dead. Please, said Moomin Troll, don't talk about him being dead all the time. It's too sad. Well, when one's dead, one's dead, said Tutiki kindly. This squirrel will become earth all than his time, and still later they'll grow trees from him, and new squirrels will be skipping about in them. Do you think that is so very sad? Perhaps not, said Moomin Troll, and blew his snout. In any case... He's going to be buried tomorrow, and his tail too, and we'll have a nice and very proper funeral. Author's note. In case the reader slash listener, it feels like having a cry, please take a quick look at page 126. So now you have to go and get this book and read that page, make yourself feel better. Um, so, uh, just to draw your attention to the Spotify playlist that the awesome DJ Stegosaurus uh, has been putting together for us. We now have a playlist that goes with each of this, uh, this is season three of the salons. It's, it, there's one for each of the, of, the, of the salon episodes. And they are eclectic and they are awesome. And the one for this one has a song about Tutiki on it from back in the day. Uh, and it has loads more beside, including um, stuff for the music that's sort of around now through a whole lot of different time periods and also bits of Tove reading her work um, in, in her own language as well, which is rather lovely. Um, I'm going to finish by singing you a song, sort of, it's, it's dedicated to my mum because, um, as I say, she she led me to all those interesting people and books. Um, I won't tell you loads about her because I'm going to talk about her a bit more next next time we have a salon because it'll be a Mother's Day special. Uh, we're going to talk about, about, about mothers and uh, all their complexity and our relationships with them. Um, but uh, I will just say that she wanted me to learn this song um, when I was first picking up the uke and uh, I knew I uh, about three chords at that point and I couldn't play this, it's got a key change and everything. I might not be able to play it now, we'll, we'll find out. Um, uh, but I'm excited to be able to add it in at the end here uh, in honour of uh, mums and, and Tove and with great thanks to uh, all my team and my special guest, Bella, as well. Hope you've had a lovely time. See you soon. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? And what's on the other side? Rainbows are visions, but only The lovers, the dreamers and me Who said that every wish will be heard and answered When wished on the morning star Somebody thought of that and someone believed them Look what it's done
done so far. What's so amazing that keeps us stargazing? What do we think we might see? Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. All of us under its spell, we know that it's probably magic. Have you been half asleep? Have you heard voices? I've heard them calling my name. These are the sweet sounds that called the young sailors. The voice might be one and the same. I've heard it too many times to ignore it. It's something I'm supposed to be. Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers and me. La 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 la